so yet again, a CFP for OpenFest in Sofia, Bulgaria. Then we have Mathieu talking about Wayland uh, progress uh, on OpenBSD. Uh, Mohamed talking about uh, sub packages. Or was no, no that <laughs> was Lu Luigi package. about sub packages, and you've been talking. Right. Um, okay, so he's still formatting. formatting, but you can come up already. So, uh, hi, my name is Teriana Shopova. Um, I know you guys live, love conferences, so um, I want to invite you to one. Um, so, OpenFest uh, is a local conference in Sofia, Bulgaria. Um, it's dedicated to free and open source uh, and also open culture. It's not uh, BSD only. Uh, it's about all open source, uh, like operating systems, projects, um, hardware um, also. It's going to be um, on the fifth, 4th and 5th of November. Uh, 2023 this year obviously at the John Atanasu Forum at Sofia Tech Park, Sofia Bulgaria Earth. Uh, there's a website uh, where you can find additional info and the conference is uh, well free as, it, as free beer, <laughs> no registration required. Uh, so we had the first edition back in 2003 and someone on the team uh, cannot do proper math so they think it's uh, the 20th edition this year and I think it's the 21st and we didn't skip a year. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, we have a call for participation running. We are currently looking for partners, sponsors, um, who will support the event. Also, we do have uh, the call for uh, uh, papers running right now. The website says um, the deadline is the 17th of September, which happens to be tomorrow. But I will tell you a secret. We are going to extend it by a week <laughs> at least. So you have like uh, eight more days to submit an interesting proposal for a talk. Also, um, well, uh, if you, or even if you don't have any experience helping out organizing a conference, we are always looking for help, and Sophie is a nice place, so we have um, a call for volunteers open. Um, and yeah, that's the QR code to the um, call for papers. Uh, we do have, uh, we organize the talks in several tracks, uh, which are technical, advanced technical, social. We also have an open art uh, track this year, uh, which is um, something uh, we're experimenting with again, uh, dedicated to open arts. And we also have a um, MISC track uh, that is for anything interesting that doesn't fit the other tracks. So if you have an, uh, an idea that you think might fit, just uh, throw it at us and um, join us in Sofia in November. <laughs> and you can find more info on the website. We try to keep them updated. So I hope to see you there. I'm going to show you a bit of the work that I've done uh, during the summer to get uh, Wayland running on uh, OpenBSD. Uh, it's there. Uh, I hope that the sound is okay. Uh, so, uh, a bit of my background, um, but I wanted to go t to go fast there. Just it's not the first time that I bring up a uh, Windows system uh, on some uh, new machine or OS. Uh, who in the room does not know anything about Wayland? Okay, good. So, well, uh, Wayland basically is now 10 years old, so it's not so, so new anymore, but uh, it's uh, clearly the successor of X11 for the windowing system on desktop machines running uh, Linux and uh, BSD also in the future, because no one works on X11 anymore, so it's basically dead by now. Uh, th there are some uh, 
basic differences between X11 and Wayland. The main one is that uh, the Wayland application do uh, use uh, EGL to directly uh, talk to the to the hardware, and uh, th there is no client-server protocol uh, at the same level as in X11. There are still client-server uh, uh, protocols, but uh, it's a uh, much uh, lower level, and there is uh, no more separate window manager. It's the Wayland compositor, which is both the Wayland server and the window manager, and this has uh, some uh, implication in the way that you uh, that you use it. And, uh, so where to start to port Wayland to a, a, a new system? The first thing is to choose a compositor that we are going to start with. And for various reasons, I decided to go with uh, WL Roots and Sway. Uh, basically, Western, the reference uh, implementation, has too many Linuxism uh, to start with. It's prob probably doable to port Western to OpenBSD, but it's much more work. Mutter and Kawin, the GNOME and KDE stuff, are also way too, la too large to start with. So WL Roots uh, looked really like a good compromise. I've been saying for uh, f three or four years by now that on the output pass we have all, wa all what we need in uh, OpenBSD and in most of the other BSD too. Wh once you have DRM and MISA working, uh, you have the EGL pipes already. The input is a bit uh, more difficult because uh, Wayland assumes the Linux EVDev and libinput model for keyboard, mouse and so on and we need to emulate that at some point. Uh, FreeBSD apparently chose to implement EVDev in the kernel and have a fully uh, Linux compatible input pass. Uh, on OpenBSD we are clearly not to g going this way but we have some uh, work that was done by Martin Piocho uh, six years ago to have a, a port of libinput uh, that was almost working. I did, uh, I did a few days of work on uh, libinput uh, during uh, the hackathon in Tallinn uh, the, uh, in July uh, to add more support and to, to fix uh, some things that, uh, that were not uh, perfectly okay with this uh, libinput port, but, but by now at least we have something working. Uh, the, uh, and so the, the other thing is to get uh, WL roots and uh, say why, what are the software dependencies of uh, to build WL roots and uh, see what is missing and add uh, ports for that. Basically, there were some libraries that are easy to port, uh, lib display info and graphics uh, lift off. It's just software that uh, just builds out of the box on OpenBSD. CD, the seat management uh, daemon, is a bit more tough, but fortunately, WL Roots has a pass through mode where you uh, basically all the CD functions are, the, are, are just stubs and uh, that works okay for now. So I did a bit more work on trying to get uh, the CD working with uh, several uh, virtual consoles and so on, but uh, for now I'm not using that. As I said, uh, I did some work on libinput to add proper uh, keyboard translation tables, to add uh, the handling of uh, scrolling event for touchpads because all the work that I, I did was uh, using a touchpad and not a regular mouse. Uh, and uh, also the library needs to be properly built by hiding all the internal symbols, o otherwise it will conflict with uh, WL roots because they use the same kind of uh, internal uh, list uh, managing libraries and so on. Uh, so there is the WL Roots itself, the main uh, helper library. This is the one that has the most of the de dependencies. And once, once you have WL, WL Roots built, then uh, Wayland and uh, Sway, just uh, the, the actual compositor is just uh, trivial to, to build. And then we need a few applications. Back in July, I ported Havoc, a very simple terminal e emulator, and WEV. The, the Wayland uh, cousin of uh, XEV to be able to debug the, the, the input events uh, to, uh, to, to be able to dump them. 
Then later in August, I did some more work with the help of other OpenBSD developers. Uh, Ingo Schwarze added uh, support for uh, SHAR32T uh, and the USHAR header to the, lips, uh, to the OpenBSD libc so that we can build more applications that uh, are using this to represent uh, Unicode strings. Uh, we also need a port of the C11 uh, Swedes library. This was uh, easy. I just uh, stole the FreeBSD code and uh, added it as a port. And then I can build the Foot, which is a better terminal emulator than, uh, uh, than Havoc. And there are other applications that uh, also build uh, when we have all this uh, stuff. There are some trivial patches to en enable uh, Wayland support in GTK and Firefox. And at some point, Firefox did work natively in, uh, with, uh, uh, with Wayland. The recent uh, Firefox uh, versions are unfortunately broken with Wayland, but I don't know. Landry told me that apparently he was too strict uh, uh, commenting out some parts of the Firefox code that uh, use Wayland, and that it's just a matter of uh, fixing that. So uh, I will work with him in the next weeks to, to, to do that. And if we want to go further, well, libinput still needs some work. For now, there is no mouse acceleration. Uh, my mouse is painfully slow, and uh, well, it just needs to add the code uh, there. Uh, there is also uh, in WL roots there, there, there is the notion of uh, input backends, and we could replace the lib we could perhaps uh, uh, replace the libinput based backend by a pure WSCons backend, but I, I haven't spent too much time uh, looking at that. We need more Linux compatibility stuff. Uh, we need to, tr tr to try to build more uh, GTK and KDE applications. And uh, we, uh, we need to have a way to package this properly into the system. One uh, big issue is that Wayland has too many dependencies to be added to the base system like we did with Xenokara. Uh, so the installer will, be, will need to be able to install ports if we want to be able to boot into a graphical desktop uh, directly. And also there is a problem of doing this on architecture that don't have the array and uh, uh, we will, we will, I have not tried at all to see how it goes uh, on IMD 60, on uh, ARM 64, for example, we have the AI there, uh, but I don't know if it works. Demo we've just seen when I started the, my slides that I'm running way on. Uh, and if you want to help with this, because I'm not going to do that alone uh, in OpenBSD, uh, basically anyone who has some uh, basic C language and debugging skills, uh, access to the OpenBSD 3 and knows a bit how to build things there. Maybe a, b a bit of knowledge about the Maison build system, which is used by most of the Wayland stuff. A look at the WS console driver. One thing that I would need uh, help is that uh, there are more and more people writing nice stuff for Wayland in Rust. And I have no, well, we have Rust support in OpenBSD, uh, but I have no, not tested yet to build any of those nice utilities, and I, I don't know much about uh, Rust, so I need help there. And basically, if you want to help, just go to the uh, to the Arch Linux Wayland page and pick up some nice tools and try to port them. And that's it. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Luca Vitsenik. I'm part um, committer in FreeBSD and I work on sub packages. Um, what they are? So basically, is the ability to have uh, from one port multiple packages. There is flavors like Python. You have a Python pack uh, ports, and then you create Python 3.7, 3.8, 3.9 from the same information from the same recipe. And sub packages instead is one build. You create multiple packages directly. So you can basically split the outputs of, of, of a port uh, into multiple packages. Um, the reason, the main reason is to reduce the build time. So there are packages that can be 
applications like Qt or PHP, uh, you have one tarball with a lot of stuff and you want to split them in modules. Uh, at the moment, there are slave ports, the, the, the old name, kind of deri der derivation port. There are tricks to do that, but it's not, uh, it's not very good. So every time you need to extract the same tarball, build only that part, configure to build only a, a section of it. The idea here is to build everything and package basically the uh, Qt or PHP in already module, so you don't need to make any uh, adjustment. Um, we are very fast on it. Uh, Matt started implementation in 2018. Um, got stopped for five years. Um, that was the previous review, and now I restarted. Um, let me see if I can hold it. No, I can't hold it. Anyway, the risk is um, there will be packages everywhere. Um, the prolification of packages. That is one of the risks. And, and why? The um, sub-packages enable uh, a Linuxism. That is, many distribution you can have the minus devil, minus doc. You can basically split a package in multiple packages. That is something that usually uh, we don't do. Um, there are pro and cons. There are embedded systems. People say, oh, nice, because now we can not install documentation, man pages, uh, header files. Basically, you strip down things to uh, to the minimum, but it's a huge breaking change. Uh, if you're used to install a package and you have everything there, just imagine a library, then you have the headers, you have the static library, you have everything. Uh, now it's not that anymore, so you, your Ansible playbooks are going to be broken and things like that. Um, and pretty sure there will be uh, a lot of heated discussion <laughs> in the uh, in the community if we follow this uh, direction. Uh, so that's why, at the moment, this specific thing is not uh, in the scope uh, because it's a very destructive uh, change. So that's why it's really not in the scope. It's really, just, just to remember, uh, there were probably people uh, looking at it and streaming, it's not in the scope. And if I forget to say it, it's really <laughs> not in the scope. <laughs> um, where we are at? So there is a, a review. Um, so the, pr the work is basically done from the framework perspective. So uh, we have, so it's not yet uh, committed. There is another review uh, that I'm using basically as a subtree uh, when there are um, examples. So I'm not using real packages at the moment as example because it, you know building stuff, it takes time. So I just want to have some dummy uh, parts to create stuff. Um, and it also contains this minus docs, minus example implementation, but that thread is not to be uh, merged. Podrier, I don't know if you know what Podrier is, is the way to build packages, basically how we build all the packages for FreeBSD. Uh, well, Podrier needs to know of this. It's not transparent on with this change. Um, it's working, so we have an implementation that is running, uh, but the patch is horrible, so I, I'm polluting the quality of the code, so I need to clean up my patch before uh, to be committed. Is a view uh, on what it looks like. Um, well, pretty easy. Uh, what I mean, this is a, a, an example. It, uh, it's a package called port test. Uh, with sub-packages, you define all the sub-packages that you want. In this case, common two. Uh, you can define internal dependencies between packages. In this case, just say, hey, you common to, you can only, I mean, I'm common to, I need the main package as well. I cannot run standalone. Uh, and then there is the ability to associate additional sub packages with options. So if I enable an option in a port, I can generate basically additional sub packages. Um, and then when you just make a package at the bottom, you see that there are basically multiple packages built while before we're just supporting one. Um, the most important change, and that is extremely small, uh, is that in the package now I added an annotation that basically specify this is a sub package. So you know, you can know if you install that basically what it is. Um, the biggest problem was about specifying a sub package as a dependency. Uh, in, in the port tree, usually there are basically two ways to specify a dependency, but let's say in this case, this is another port. I want to use the port test common two as a dependency, so that is, oh, I need this package to run. Uh, the problem is that 
here you specify the pores. Okay, this is the origin of the pores. Oh, that is. But now you don't want the pores. You want only a piece of it. And this tilde notation has been added to specify uh, exactly this. Um, and that's why uh, we need to change uh, Poitrier a lot. Roadmap is pretty straightforward. Um, once I'm comfortable with the review, uh, we can run an exploration so we can try to build everything without using uh, any sub packages. Basically, we only introduce the feature in the framework, but not using it uh, to identify regressions. Then we change Podrier uh, with the updated version. Again, we check that there is no regression, and only that we are going to uh, have a control adoption um, and documentation. Um, to see how it goes. To basically, to we are very conservative. We want to be uh, conservative on, on the adoption uh, because it's a lightning talk. If you have questions or feedback, feel free to reach me. Uh, and that's it. Well, Seven minutes. That was a record. Question. Are the script packages in scope? Are the? The script packages in scope. No. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, to go fast, so uh, a, a quick introduction. My name is Mohammed Nurul Deal. To make it short for you, just call me Noor. Uh, I'm a software engineer. Work for a, a post startup in uh, a small post startup in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Together with uh, Misha Peters, the guy behind uh, Open uh, BSD Amsterdam, one of the partner sponsors, and uh, Jeroen Janse, uh, the guy behind Lilo, one of the guys behind Lilo, and he's the one back there. Uh, together we're uh, running the BSD NL uh, meetup. We're basically tinkering with uh, all sorts of things about the Unix, BSD, Illumis. And that's actually the reason why I came here today. Um, you can follow us on uh, Mastodon and you can uh, read more information about and, uh, the meetup group here. And there's also information how to chat with us over our own instance of uh, Mattermost. Again, managed and installed by Lilo, Jeroen Janse. And I do, when I have time, and I'm not trying to injure myself, do some woodworking, some, I'm a woodworking uh, worker wannabe, if you, you can call it. I did deliver a project in production, a whole bed for my uh, nephew. Uh, so. Okay, as I mentioned, one of the uh, reasons I'm here is that we're tinkering with hardware in the BSD and L uh, meetup, and uh, Misha and Jansa are, uh, Jeroen Jansa are very interested into everything networking. So they challenged me with this mini router from uh, CD Studio. I think you can see it here. It's, uh, with all my due respect, of course, to China. It's another Chinese company that built the uh, ARM uh, uh, hardware. And basically, it's a, a, a mini router or router uh, that is uh, built around the uh, Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4. I hope that's not a bad sign. <laughs> anyway, uh, to cut the story short, it looks like that it should be easy to install because it's Raspberry Pi and it's the same basically SOC as Raspberry Pi 4, but it's not. It's, not the, sa it's the same SOC, that's true, but it's not the same configuration. And uh, for some reason that you can read about uh, more on, uh, online, it's configured to boot from the either the EMC that is on the board if not, the SD uh, card slot. So actually, uh, if you see here, or it should be a bit down somewhere, you see an SD card actually slot in that carrier board. But if you have a, a, a Raspberry Pi compute module forward with EMC on board, it will not boot from there. Even if you change the booting uh, configuration, which you can through a tool I'm going to show. So that's one one uh, fake thing that you need to overcome, uh, USB. You see at least, uh, in this case, at least uh, two USB ports. It's not going to happen, you cannot boot from the USB port. I honestly don't know why. There is a lot of uh, discussions about that. Tried all the suggested configurations, it just didn't work. Funny enough though, so till the, the board itself boots, 
and even the install media from uh, OpenBSD with U boot boots, you cannot see whatever put into the port. Once OpenBSD itself, in this case the installation program starts, the, the you can actually see the for in this in this case the USB stick and actually that's actually the only reason why I'm going to install OpenBSD on this port with this trick. Again, if someone from the OpenBSD community can later explain to me the uh, intricacies of this, I would like to learn, really. Uh, the tricks about making USB work, it has to do with the on-the-go mode. I don't know what exactly the details of that, but there's a different configuration that you can try, and everybody says that should work, that should work, never, not, nothing worked. Something else interesting, which might be a bug, is if you use, and there is an HDMI uh, mini, I think, or micro HDMI port on the board, and you see the booting sequence when it starts, but it comes, I think, after the U-boot and then nothing. And there is no, uh, if you put, for example, a keyboard here or a mouse, there is no control whatsoever. It might be a bug because I read on one of the mailing lists that with some configuration it should work, but it was for the Raspberry Pi uh, SPC, Raspberry Pi 4, but it didn't work here. And I tried it on or with OpenBSD 7.1, OpenBSD 7.2, given that it was an old discussion, and, and of course with OpenBSD 7.3, it didn't work. So again, if someone from the OpenBSD community can say if it's a bug or something, Okay, now getting to work. Uh, so I shared with you one secret of how, whether you have EMC or not, that makes a lot of difference. And uh, the, the second key component to actually control this board is to get this tool from uh, Raspberry Pi, is the, the USB boot. With this, you can do two things. I'm going to show you quickly. I'm not going to go through the whole sequence given the limited time, but yes. But that will solve a lot. So one thing is that you have to boot the board into what they call the, uh, the boot mode, which is basically shortening two pins here. I'm using a jumper, but in, the, in one of the items we just used two wires and it worked. And when you do this, and then you boot up the, the board, you see things blinking. But you can do two things with this tool. One is, uh, you have this command, if you run it, as I'm going to do now. Uh, yes, but I hope it doesn't screw things up. <laughs> that be, uh, visible enough? Okay. But when you do it like this, basically what it does, uh, it uses something called Linux gadget file system if I remember correctly, and what it does, it exposes the EMMC to your host, in this case your laptop, as just a mess storage device. So you can simply flash, as one of the steps I can share later, flash in uh, the, the mini root uh, uh, install media from OpenBSD 7.3, okay? That's one trick, and you can just uh, do this, or I don't have to do it. And if you go to into, in this case, the recovery, you can basically uh, build the EEB ROM uh, media and you can flash it to the EEB ROM uh, flash memory on the, not on the carrier board, but on the uh, Raspberry Pi compute module board. So you can do two things with this tool. And actually, you need, you need to, to do these steps. The EEB ROM media is not necessary unless you want to, as you can see here, change the boot configuration, which is equivalent to the BIOS or UEFI configuration and some config configuration. But you can follow the steps without changing anything and you will be uh, good to go. And the second thing is that if you want to get the latest uh, image from, uh, the EBROM image from Raspberry Pi itself. And that's about it. So basically, the steps are like this. You get these, all this nice software and the media. You flash the install, the full one on the US, a USB stick. You flash the mini root on the EMC. And then, I need to switch this back. Then you unset it so it boots normally. And then you need this nice little thing, which is basically a USB. Is it U, A, R, T, or U, R? U, R. U, R. Okay, adapter. And 
they need to connect it as the green is here. Trick that. We had to to do some modification because there the board itself doesn't come with the pins, so there was a bit of soldering sessions at the meetup. So it was fun. And yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit hazy, so sometimes it but what happens, it's a, it's a little bit complicated, at least to me, maybe for, for some of you experience that it's no, there is some of booting code on the SOC itself, like in the firmware, just to initialize some hardware. Then it uh, boots from the EMC, in this case, on the board itself. If you don't have that, then from the SD card, then basically, uh, in this case, that's the install me mini root install media from uh, OpenBSD 7.3. You follow it as it is, that's one part of the trick. In one of the steps, you will have to reformat the EMC as your standard uh, file system that you will boot from out at the end of the steps. But then you will lose, if you have it already, the file sets. So the trick is that you do the file sets on a different media. In this case, just to reuse it, uh, I have the install 7.3 uh, image. So basically, I can install from it, and it has the file sets. In one of the steps, it asks you, do you have another disk from which you have the file ses sets? You say yes. You install it from here, and at the end, you have a, a mini router with uh, OpenBSD 7.3. That's it.